And who would have ever known what was in that program? He never opened it up. Could have been the agenda for today's luncheon, which I've totally blown here on a timing point of view. Could have been a plea, could have been a request to make a difference, to be a friend, to change lives on behalf of Compeer throughout this great land of ours. And Coach, Coach Wooden gets us to settle down and calm down for that one last bit of advice. And we're like, ready, come on, Coach, tell us. What's it gonna take? How do we become great? How do we win this game? Coach Wooden, no longer the cage tiger, no longer barking out the maxims, looks at us in the calmest, most determined voice you've ever heard. And he says, men, I've done my job. The rest is up to you. When that game starts, don't ever look over at the sideline because I can't help you anymore. Now let's get going. It's on your shoulders. We looked at each other and said, yeah, let's go. So we raced out of there. 20,000 fans just erupt in applause. The cheerleaders kicking their legs up in the air. The band just pounding away. Mickey Hart and Bill Kreutzmann on the drums. What could be better? And then just before tip-off, Coach Wooden sneaks out onto the court. No hype, no grand ceremonial entrance with bodyguards with funny hats. I mean, what does Coach Wooden, what does a basketball coach need bodyguards for? I, I can imagine how the current coaches at UCLA might need some bodyguards, but this was Coach Wooden with no ego, no self-promotion, no hype. He sneaks around from behind the bleachers and calls us over one last time just before the game's about to begin. And while you can't hear a thing in the building, it's white noise, it's what you live for, just goosebumps all over your body. When the 12 of us, the winners of the genetic lottery, we stand and hover over this little 5'8 diminutive guy from Martinsville, Indiana. What a perfect couple he would have made with Bunny over there, just absolutely perfect. Coach Wooden looks up at us with those sad, soft eyes again. And he says to us, men, the only thing I ask of you tonight is that when you walk out of this gym, this building, you can go straight back to your dorm room and open that closet door and look yourself straight in the mirror and to be able to convince yourself that you did your best and that you didn't beat yourself because when you beat yourself, it's the worst kind of defeat you'll ever suffer and you'll never get over it. We thought he was nuts about that, the shoes and socks, the crazy maxims, the pyramid. Why would we believe him? We won every game. We trounced everybody. Just an unbelievable record-setting team. It wasn't until January 19th, 1974, UCLA at Notre Dame, an 88 game winning streak on the line, an 11 point lead on the ball with two minutes to go in an era that predated the shot clock and the three point shot, and we gave a game away to Digger Phelps, the one day in his life Digger Phelps ever did anything. And then March 23rd, 1974, six short weeks later, a 14 point lead with four and a half minutes to go in regulation, a seven point lead with 90 seconds to go in the second overtime, and we gave the game away, a championship game with Tommy Burleson as the starting center of the other team. Goodness gracious sakes alive, what kind of player do you think you are anyway, Walton? And we, did, what we didn't realize until it was too late. Everything that Coach Wooden told us was just absolutely right in the mark. And that's why when he pushed us out that last time, just before the game was to start, Coach Wooden looked at us and he said, men, remember, basketball, like life, is a game, a simple game indeed, but it's a game that must be played and that players make plays. Plays don't make players. And it's not how many shots you make, it's how many shots you take. Now let's get it going up and down. So we walk out there and we are ready and everything is just in perfect order. We are ready to trounce whoever the hapless victims are. And so as we walk out there, Coach Wooden sits in his chair Never got up during the course of the game, never wildly gesturing to draw attention to himself. And before the game started, he crosses his legs and looks back over his left shoulder. And they're in the same seat for every game. For the 40 years of his coaching, teaching career was his ultimate teammate, Nell Wooden, his junior high school sweetheart, the only girl he ever dated. Much the way that Ben and Pam have helped build this community here. John Wooden looked back at Nell Wooden and said, everything's just perfect. We are on top of things tonight. And then turning back to the game, when that ball was put up in the air and two hands go ever higher to decide one more time the fate of Western civilization, Coach Wooden telling us to never look over him during the course of the game. We're racing up and down, celebrating 
celebrating his vision, his legacy, the tradition, and carrying it all on as proudly as we could possibly do, Coach Wooden takes that little rolled up program, raises it to his mouth, and spends the next two to two and a half hours just razzing the referees and taunting the other team. It was absolutely unbelievable. And as we move forward to the conclusion of this presentation, as I get through with the introductory remarks, <laughs> I want to remind you that when I went into the Basketball Hall of Fame, in 1993, 12 short years ago, as the most injured player in the history of basketball. 14 years in the great NBA, and I missed a total of nine and a half full seasons because these wretched legs of mine with the structural congenital defects would not carry me to my dreams. And here I was up there. We all had five minutes that night to give our remarks and our thanks. At the 17 minute mark of my five minutes of allotted time, the guy from the NBA in the back of the room jumps up and says, come on, Walton, let's wrap this thing up. Your speech is starting to last longer than your career did. And in wrapping it up, I want to share one more thought. A thought of what Compeer and Ricky Palermo mean to me. For those of you who have had the unsolvable health issues, who have spent your lives, like I spent 20 years of mine in the hospital, with life spinning hopelessly out of control. There was a day I was in Whittier, California, again, Nixon, the Prince of Darkness. It all comes back to Nixon all the time. And there we were, everybody who went to this doctor's office, the worst of the worst foot problems. And here we were, everybody on crutches, everybody in wheelchairs. And I'm sitting there waiting for the doctor who's always running late. And this guy, handsome as can be, looked a lot like Ricky Palermo from Patavia, New York, just outside of your hometown. And he was up and down the hallway. He's on his crutches. And every time he goes by my room, he looks at it, that's Bill Walton. What's Bill Walton doing in here? And finally, after seven passes, every time he went by, I put my head down because I wanted no part of it. I just wanted my doctor's report and I wanted to get out of there. And so he finally just bursts right into my room, closes the door behind me and pins me up against the wall and I know I'm trapped. He just locks in eye contact to me. And he says, hey, you're Bill Walton. I said, yeah. He said, I need some help, Bill. I said, no problem. What do you need? You need me to come give a speech to your school? You need me to give your kids some autographs? Whatever it is, no problem. We can cover it. He said, no, Bill, that's not it at all. I'm 26 years old, Bill, and the doctor? He just cut both of my legs off above my knees. And I'm having trouble staying positive in life. I'm having trouble staying upbeat and figuring out what's next for me. And I felt like the biggest and most selfish schmuck in the world. And that's why every time I leave my house, every day when I go out to do battle, and battle is indeed we're out there involved in right now as we battle the forces of fear and intimidation and exclusion and the plutocracy, as we try to make a difference, as we try to be a friend and change lives out there with a message of hope, joy, and optimism. I always stop right by my fireplace, because over that fireplace I've got a picture, a memorabilia piece from the Grateful Dead. And while you might think it's a memorabilia piece, it's really a get well card. Because the band, they heard that when I was 28 years old, that the injury that I suffered in April 1978, when I took an ill-advised pain-killing injection and the bone in my foot split in half and I was unable to play basketball ever again to a level that I had once played as the MVP in the NBA at 23 years of age, the Grateful Dead heard that if that foot didn't start getting better very quickly, that amputation was the next order of the day. And so they all signed this piece of memorabilia as a get well card. Jerry Garcia, come on, big guy, we want to see you dancing. Bob Weir, let's go, big man, that big, ugly face, we want to see you smiling out there one more time. And Bill Kreutzman, Phil Lesh, Brent Midland, all the crew, Ramrod, Steve, Billy Grillo, Kid, they all signed it. And then across the bottom, it's a big aerial photograph, 300,000 fans, there, everybody jumping up and down, balloons everywhere, the happiest, most positive, upbeat situation you've ever seen. And across the drum heads of this aerial photograph, Mickey Hart, the Hall of Fame drummer, he writes, Bill, never look back. And that's why I always stop by as I'm out the door, 700,000 miles a year, 110 events a year for ESPN ABC, doing everything I can to try to make a difference, to try to be a friend, to try to change lives. I put my hand right there and I thank them as I thank you for giving me the greatest life that anybody could ever have. And that's why the wheel came full circle for me when I was broadcasting as a dad and my son was playing in the game. It was four years ago, Arizona versus Illinois. And at the very end of the game, it was the NCAA regional championship game and the winner's going to the final four. And Lute Olson, the 21st version, 21st century version of John Wooden looks down to the end of the bench and Luke Walton, the deep reserve at the time, says, Luke, get in there. And 